I've spoken a lot about how passive static stretching really sucks. I've told you how it's low value and how it doesn't achieve positive results compared with other similar modalities. But does it always suck? Or are there times where passive stretching might not only be useful, but necessary? This video is in defense of passive stretching. First, I'll explain and summarize very quickly why I think passive static stretching sucks for most people most of the time in most situations. But then I'll tell you why in some situations for some people sometimes Times, passive static stretching is the way to go. This video was inspired by a question that a member, an all access member on my website asked me. Yes, I do this kind of thing for members. If you wanna be a member, check out the link in the description. Real quick, some definitions. For an example, I'm going to use the extension of this finger right here. So this movement in this direction for this finger. My passive range of motion would be if I use an outside force to grab this finger and physically pull it as far back as it can go and I can pull it pretty far. However, if I try to use the muscles that actually control this finger, I can't take it nearly as far. As far as I can go is right there. So the difference between my passive range of motion, which is all the way up here, and my active range of motion, where my finger snaps to right there, is pretty significant. And that means that all of the difference between my active and passive ranges of motion, in my opinion, is a bit of a liability. That's range of motion that I'm not in control of. So if somebody starts off with a ton of passive range of motion and not much active range of motion, they have a huge gap, a huge liability. So for that person, I would want them to work on their active range of motion and strength and control within their range of motion. They don't need more passive range of motion. They already have enough. And when I say passive stretching, I just mean taking the tissues into a stretch and then just relaxing and staying perfectly still in that passive static stretch. Versus an active stretch might be I take the tissue onto a little bit of a stretch, but then I push back, so I'm firing up the muscles that are being stretched. So when I say passive static stretching sucks, I don't mean that all types of stretching all the time suck. I just mean passive static stretching. Here's a quick summary of why passive static stretching has very little value. Stretching temporarily makes your muscles weak, so if you're gonna exercise or have an athletic event, you're gonna perform worse. Stretching does not reduce your risk of getting injured or feeling soreness the next day after exercise. Being flexible might actually increase your injury risk. And generally speaking, being flexible and stretching does not favorably impact your overall health at all. While in comparison, things like cardio and general strength and conditioning do very favorably affect your overall heart, uh, heart health and musculoskeletal health and uh, lifespan. But sometimes passive stretching is a good idea. So here's when you're gonna want to use passive static stretching. One, active stretching might not be possible for some people sometimes. Two, if you differentiate between neurological restrictions in motion versus mechanical tissue-based restrictions in motions. Three, if you're just trying to accumulate a lot of time. Four, if you need increased proprioception or if you're clinically treating somebody. And five, because it feels good. So let's check these out. First of all, active stretching might not be possible for some people. Some people cannot perform dynamic stretching activities. They just can't do it. Active stretching might not be possible for some people. For example, there is a person who I've seen clinically who is stuck in this position right here and their hip cannot extend backwards. They cannot stand straight up. And when we challenge them to do active activities like a bridge, for example, to push the hips into extension, they just can't do it and it hurts. So some people just are not ready for very active forms of stretching, but that's okay because passive stretching can help that person be comfortable in a stretch and help to allow the tissues that have locked up that joint, literally locked up that joint, to allow them to stretch out over time. So sometimes active stretching is not possible and dynamic movement is just not possible. Okay, number two, if you can differentiate between neurological restrictions in flexibility versus mechanical tissue-based restrictions in flexibility. Most of the time with most people, their nervous system is physically stopping their muscles from stretching out. But the actual ligaments and tendons and fascia is perfectly fine. So they don't need long periods of passive stretching at their end range. What they need is to actively use the muscle, contract the muscle eccentrically to lengthen it. And that tells that your brain and your nerves and your spinal cord, that movement is safe. And then your nervous system says, 
okay, that's fine. Go ahead and stretch it out. We trust you. So a lot of times an active approach to stretching can reveal very, very, very quick improvements in flexibility because it was neurologically driven. On the other hand, somebody might not have enough passive range of motion. So earlier when I said maybe somebody has a ton of passive range of motion and not very much active range of motion, well, some people just don't have any passive range of motion. In that case, if we hit a mechanical barrier and we fire it up and we do PNF stretching and we're just not getting anywhere, then it's time to hang out in a passive stretch and just accumulate time there because we do need to actually physically take the, the collagen fibers and, and get them to have more elastic properties. And we need the fibers of the fascia to lay down and remodel the tissue. And so long periods of time with static passive stretching for that individual are going to be beneficial because they have such reduced passive range of motion. And we already tried the neurological tricks of end range contractions and PNF stretching and they didn't work. So we have to do passive stretching for that person. So if you can differentiate between neurologically driven restrictions in motion versus mechanically or tissue based restrictions in motion, then you know when to do active based mobility work versus passive stretching. Okay, next up is to accumulate time. Holding active stretching, you can only hold it for so long before your muscles fatigue. So if you need to accumulate lots of time under tension to physically remodel the fascia, the tendons, the ligaments, the collagen fibers essentially, then the best way, the easiest way to accumulate time under tension is with passive static stretching because you can hang out all day. So again, if you have somebody where they really do need to lay down new tissue and remodel the fascia, it just takes a lot of time and tension pulling on those fibers to tell the DNA of the fibro blasts to excrete a different matrix of collagen in the tissues so that we have a remodeling process. So if you need to accumulate time, passive stretching is your friend. Next, proprioception and clinical treatment. Proprioception comes from the joints. Your joints are the number one source of where am I in space? And your joints communicate this information through the nerves up the spinal cord to the brain. So moving a joint is really good information to your brain, especially when we use it clinically. So if you're a licensed healthcare provider of some kind and you perform some kind of manual therapy, moving joints is a really good way to give your brain good feedback, rehab people, and get them feeling better. So in that case, sometimes we need to go into the passive range of motion especially if they have a mobility restriction where they don't even have nearly enough passive range of motion. Then we really need to accumulate some time. We need to go into the passive range. We need to hold into the passive range. And sometimes, clinically speaking, if you are a licensed provider and you know what you're doing, you can even push a little past a person's end range passive range of motion. And that gives a whole burst of input to the brain of, oh my God, that's what's happening in this joint. And then your brain, which was outputting pain, 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 because I don't know what's happening in this joint. But now we, for example, as a chiropractor, uh, well, soon to be chiropractor, I'm just a few weeks away here. If you crack a joint, then the joint says, oh, this is where I'm at in space. And the brain says, oh, that's okay. I get it. Let's stop making you feel pain. That's just a long-winded and complicated way of saying movement is medicine. So clinically speaking, sometimes we need to do passive stretching, but we don't do it just all over the place and sort of, oh, let's stretch that and let's stretch that, let's stretch that. No, we find, we analyze, let's look at all your you know areas, your joints, your tissues, and let's not stretch everything passively. Let's find where you legitimately have restrictions in motion and let's stretch those things passively if we need it. So clinically speaking, and for good proprioception, sometimes some passive stretching is okay. And the last reason is simply because it feels good. I think that a lot of people can relate and they just get all, you know, upset. Oh, well, don't tell me that passive stretching sucks. I like passive stretching. It feels good. Cool. Do it. And I totally agree. Passive stretching does feel good. So if you're doing it because it feels good, that's okay. Let me just give you a couple cautionary notes so that if it feels good, you can do it in a way that is sustainable and useful for you and not likely to cause more hypermobility and more excessive ranges of motion that you cannot control. So if you're going to passively, statically stretch and it feels good, 
Great, here's how to do it safely. One, make sure you don't push forcefully to your end range of passive flexibility. Two, if you feel joint pain, back off. Three, don't do it all the damn time and don't do it all over the entire body just because. If you are gonna do some passive static stretching, try to do it in some really targeted areas that really could use it. Next, don't do a bunch of passive static stretching before you do intense exercise. Passive static stretching will make your muscles weak and you will perform worse with your intense exercise or athletic endeavors. And lastly, if you're going to do passive stretching, please do try to only use it as a portion of your activity. So use it as a stepping stone into more active and more active, more active ranges of motion, more more active, dynamic exercises. Clinically speaking, even if I'm working with somebody who physically cannot do any active ranges of motion and use their muscles because it causes them so much pain, for example, or they just have joints that are literally just stuck up and frozen, if you will, even though I hate that term, I am trying as hard as I can to get that person from a passive modality to an active form of rehab as quickly as possible. As soon as they're ready, we're gonna go ahead and abandon the passive stretching and we're moving into active mobility work or active dynamic strength training as soon as possible. So if you're going to use passive ranges of motion and passive static stretching, try to use it as a bridge to help you do more dynamic strength oriented, stability oriented movement. So I still think passive static stretching really sucks most of the time for most people in most situations. But sometimes for some people, passive static stretching is definitely the way to go. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. Be sure to like and subscribe. See you next time.